Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we celebrate the Reformation today, we are reminded how it is through your word that you work to bless us so powerfully and graciously. As we gather around your word now, we pray that you would work through that by the power of your spirit to accomplish all the things that you intend to do when you send forth your word. Bless our hearts and our minds as we hear it and receive this gracious gospel, and may it strengthen our faith and continue to fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we continue on now with Jesus' preaching, teaching, and healing. Uh, there were handouts outside the door there that you could have grabbed on the way in. Hopefully everybody's got one. Uh, let's begin. Even as he was being transfigured, Jesus knew that his true mission was not to be glorified by men, but to be glorified by the Father. And we see that when we turn to John 17, verse 1. There it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. So that meant that Jesus would have to obey the Father's plan to save mankind. According to God's plan, his Son would suffer and die for the sins of the world. Jesus knew that that dark day was coming, but before it arrived, he still had much to do. And again, that is uh, uh, something that we often miss as we study the Old Testament, is how many times it talks about God saving the world through sacrifice and, and through the death of, of an innocent servant, uh, as he's described by the prophet Isaiah. So this was not uh, something that should have been so shocking and surprising to the people in Jesus' day. If he truly was the one that God had promised to send, they should have known how uh, salvation would be accomplished. Uh, even in... And the reading from uh, Romans 3 today, we're talking about how God could be just and the justifier of, of all who put their faith in him. Well, just, you know, has to do with justice. It has to do with giving people what they deserve. And of course, what sinners deserve is eternal wrath and condemnation from God. And so it would not be just if God just said, ah, forget it. I'm not going to worry about it. I know I said I was going to punish sin, but I didn't really mean it. So just go ahead. I, I forgive you guys. It's no big deal. God could do that, but then he he would no longer be just. And we take great comfort in the fact that God keeps his word. For better or for worse, he always does what he says he'll do. And so when he said to Adam and Eve, if you eat of it, you shall surely die, you have to die because they ate of it. And, and we've sinned as well. Um, so God keeps his word in that regard. Uh, when it says uh, the wages of sin is death, God keeps his word. There is a punishment for sin. On the other hand, as it said also in Romans 3 today, all are justified freely for the sake of Christ by his grace through faith. Uh, and so um, even though it shouldn't have been a surprise that in order for God's justice to be carried out, there would have to be death. Uh, God not only was just, he also was the justifier of sinners. In other words, he had mercy on us and uh, sent his son to take our place so that he could fulfill the law, keep his word, punish sin, which he did in Christ on the cross, but then also have mercy on us by not punishing us as we deserve, but rather letting Jesus take our place as well as all of our sins to the grave with him. Uh, so God is both just and merciful, and he's able to, to be both and accomplish both through what Christ accomplished when he came to the earth. Uh, by the way, um, my mom is going to be watching this. She always does. And she says, you know, you never give anybody a chance to ask questions. She's going to love me pointing this out on the tape, by the way. But if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to either raise your hand or just blurt it out. Feel free at any time to, to ask anything or make any comments. The second paragraph, in order that people might understand who he was and what he came to do, Jesus continued to preach, teach, and heal. When he preached, Jesus called people to repentance and warned them about the dangers of rejecting him. In addition to preaching and teaching the people, Jesus also continued to help and heal all, were, all who were in need. Um, and I mentioned this in the sermon this morning about the fact that hell is real. It is surprising how many Christians reject that. I think the most recent statistic I saw, 
put it under 70% of Christians who believe hell is a real place and God sends people there. So there's at least 30% of people who call themselves Christians who don't even believe that hell is real or that anybody will be sent there. That's pretty dangerous because what you're really, by saying that, what you're saying is there's, there's no punishment for sin. There's no condemnation for it. God didn't mean what he said. And so what you're really doing is telling sinners, keep sinning. It's like the people driving towards that, that cliff and there's the bridges out and you tell them, no, keep driving. I don't want to hurt your feelings by telling you you're driving the wrong direction. So yeah, keep going. And then at some point, they're going to find out that they shouldn't have kept going that way. Somebody should have loved them enough to call them to repentance. Which is what Jesus did. People love to say how, how Jesus was so full of love and kindness, and he was. But how did he show his loving kindness? By dying. First and foremost, for sin, he died. Uh, that, that wasn't because the sin was okay with him. It was because sin was his enemy, and it had to be conquered and destroyed. And yet I think there's a number of Christians, maybe even us sometimes, who don't view sin as our enemy. Um, and then we treat it as such. Instead of avoiding it or fighting it, we sort of welcome it into our lives. And Jesus' message was repent. How many different times does Jesus mention the word hell in the New Testament? It's like over a dozen times. So, I mean, it's, it's real. And it's something that uh, he doesn't want anybody to end up there, which is why he came and died. He didn't come to set up some wonderful kingdom on earth and tell people the right way to live. He came to die so that they wouldn't have to die eternally. Um, anyway, so Jesus, uh, Jesus is not tolerant, by the way. I'll just say this. I've said it before. Jesus is not tolerant of sin. He absolutely is not tolerant of sin but he does forgive it. And that's a very important distinction that Christians need to remember. It's not okay to sin just because Jesus is willing to still love us anyway. Um, we, we take comfort in the fact that he forgives our sins, but we should never look at sin as though it's, it's ever okay. No matter what the sin is, it is always wrong. It's always against him. Okay, moving on to the third paragraph. Jesus knew that many people were tempted to think that being great on earth meant that they were also great in God's eyes. Let's look at Matthew 18, verses 2 to 4. And while you're turning to Matthew 18, if you haven't already done it, I'm just going to mention this. This actually was a pretty important part of the Reformation. Because uh, during the time of the Reformation, before the Reformers accomplished all the good they wanted to do, um, there was basically two classes of people. There was the, the priesthood, bishops and archbishops and priests and monks, and then there was everybody else. And the church at that time was telling people, if you want to be considered good in God's eyes, this is what you got to do. Join the priesthood, be a monk, be a priest, be, whatever. Be, be one of these holy vocations. If you're not part of that, then you're part of the the, the rest of the rabble. Um, and so they thought that, that by being holy, just like the Pharisees uh, 1,500 years before, that by being holy by nature of your vocation, that made you closer to God. You were better. You know, priests and bishops had no trouble looking down on everybody else because they thought they were better than everybody else. And when the Reformation came along, and Luther specifically said, no, if there is such a thing as a highest vocation, Let's just ask you guys, what's the highest vocations, there's actually two of them, they're related, um, that a human being can have? What do you think he said? Whether he's right or not, that's a different question. But what do you think Luther said? Nope, a specific vocation. Not, not a general, a servant is general, but a specific vocation. You know the answer from hearing it before. <laughs> Moms and dads, parents, no greater vocation, not priest, not pastor, that's not the highest vocation. The, one, the highest vocation is father and mother. And Luther, if he had to narrow it down to one, guess which one he picked? Mother. That was one of the great things. It's, it's, it was actually a sexual revolution of sorts in the 1500s because Luther gave great value to women. He said they were mothers. And by being mothers, they, they gave birth to children. They gave um, spiritual nourishment to their children by teaching them in the homes and loving them and, and being good examples for them. Um, that's a part of the Reformation that's often overlooked is the great value that Luther placed on parents, including women. You probably know in the 1500s, women didn't have a lot of value for most people, I guess. Luther said they absolutely have value because they're carrying out one of God's most important works on earth. 
So anyhow, um, he just turned everything upside down. Priests, bishops, Luther had no use for them. He said, yeah, they serve a purpose. So do garbage collectors. So do parents. If you're going to look at the ones that matter, look at the ones that are, you know, parents. They have the highest vocations of all. And so uh, Luther tried to break down all those distinctions and say, we are all a priesthood of believers, and all of us have different vocations to carry out, uh, both in the kingdom of God and in the kingdom of the world. Um, so it was, it was pretty revolutionary, the way that Luther approached family stuff and also the way he approached the hierarchy of power. Uh, he said, anybody who has the word of God has power. And it doesn't matter if it's a lay person or the Pope himself, because the power and authority comes from God's word, not from individual status. Okay, so th there, there has been and perhaps continues to be the idea that, that being great on earth means you're great in the eyes of God. Uh, we still have people that are called prosperity preachers. Joel Osteen is the most famous of them. And, and basically he equates uh, success on earth me, is the same as, or it shows the level of uh, faithfulness and connection to God. Uh, so if you have a tough life, it means you're just not faithful enough. You haven't prayed hard enough because if you really love God, he'll bless you and he'll make you rich and healthy and happy. Um, all baloney, of course. Um, nothing biblical about it, but lots of people like to hear that because it makes them think they have some control in their life and they can make themselves happy, healthy, and wealthy. Uh, clearly, that's unbiblical. Um, so, when people were tempted to think that being great means that somehow God has shown special favor to you, let's see what Jesus said in Matthew 18, verses 2 through 4. Somebody else, please read. He called the little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, Luther wasn't the first to turn the idea of <clears throat> um, greatness on its head. Jesus did it. You want to be great? Be like this child. Um, as, as we know well, children especially didn't have great value because they were servants. They're, you know, free slavery, <laughs> basically. You know, how many times did farmers have large families for one purpose? Yeah, yes, they loved their children and their wives, but they needed people to till the fields and milk the cows. <clears throat> So children have been looked down on, you know, as something less than great. And Jesus says, nope, you got it backwards. They're the greatest of all. <clears throat> now, moving on to what it says in the handout here. His message to them was that the more a person trusts in God, not themselves, the more they will be blessed by him. Uh, so that's what made the kingdom of God belong to children, is they didn't try to claim it for themselves. They received it freely. Um, children are great at not trying to earn things. You know, uh, on Christmas morning, there is no concern about what they need to do to get presents. They're expecting them because it's owed to them, and they're fine with that. Sometimes adults, when we trade gifts, you know, we'll feel bad because, oh, you spent all that money on me, and I didn't get you anything as nice. And, you know, all those different factors come into it. Not kids. You know, they'll make a handmade card and give it to you, and now they want the $400 PlayStation. They're not worried about earning any of those gifts. They're, they're able to freely receive them. And that's what Jesus is saying. Is if you stop thinking about yourself and whether you deserve it or what you can do to earn it, and you just receive it because he gives it to you, now you're great. Because your greatness comes from Christ, not from yourself. And so that's what he did in Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. So, I don't know if somebody's already found it. You might be ahead of me. Uh, but if you have it, go ahead. Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. And they were willing to come to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, Shall not enter. Go ahead. You bring the last line. Last sentence. Oh, 16 also? Yep. Okay. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Okay. And so Jesus, Jesus didn't just say children were great. He treated them as they were great. 
he, he rebuked the disciples for keeping them away, and he wanted to gather them in his arms and bless them. He just loved them. I don't know if God can love some more than others, but if it's at all possible to pour out a special measure of love, he certainly had it for children. We see that in how he treated them. And I suppose a lot of it has to do with the fact there was no fighting back on their part. You know, with the Pharisees and Sadducees and others who, who constantly had obstacles to their faith, the children had none. They still have none. Uh, hopefully none of them are watching this on, on video, but, you know, if you tell them about the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus or the Great Pumpkin or whatever, they believe it. <laughs> they're, they're innocent and naive, and they just believe the promises that you make to them. Um, and so if you tell them that Jesus loves them, they believe it. They don't argue with you. Well, how could he love me? I've been disobeying my parents for years now. Why would he love me? They don't argue. They just accept it as true that Jesus loves them. And that's wonderful. And so the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So, getting back to the handout here, by doing that, by gathering these children into his arms, he preached his message with more than words. His actions proclaimed it as well. Okay, in Matthew 20... Verses 17 to 19, uh, Jesus tells his disciples very clearly what his mission is. So let's read that, if somebody wouldn't mind. Verses 17 to 19 in chapter 20. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over the, to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him ever to the, over to the Gentiles and to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Thank you. As we read through that, we see Jesus is not speaking in generalities. He's not saying, when we get to Jerusalem, some bad stuff's going to happen, but in the end it's going to work out. He tells them very specifically what's going to happen. As God, he knows what is in store for him, and he tells them. Now, why does God, and he did this in the Old Testament a lot, why does God tell us ahead of time what things are going to happen? At times, he doesn't always tell us, but sometimes he tells us. Why does he do that, uh, tell us ahead of time? Anybody want to guess? Okay, for them to prepare for it, for themselves. Okay, it, it's further indication of his divinity because he can tell the future. When it happens, uh, they'll know that he was telling the truth. And that kind of ties into uh, one, of this, one of the great lines of the Old Testament. I, I should look it up sometime how many times it actually occurs, but I know it's a lot. So God says something and then he says, so that they will know I am the Lord. Whatever it is I mean, that happened with the plagues in Egypt. He, he told them ahead of time what's going to happen, and when it happened, then they will know, I am the Lord. Jesus doesn't say that here, but that's the purpose. He tells them all these things ahead of time, and when they come to pass, they will know, as Hazel said, he is the Lord. He knew this stuff was going to happen. He predicted it ahead of time, and it does come to pass. In fact, in the Old Testament it says, you want to know what the difference between a, a true prophet of God and one who's not of God? Wait and see if what they say comes true. That's how you can know a true prophet versus a false one. And, of course, the true prophets were saying death and destruction are coming, either through Assyria or later on through Babylon. And those things happened. And when it did, then they knew God was the Lord um, and that those prophets were true. So here Jesus is predicting the things that are going to happen to him. But at the very end, he tells them one other thing. After all this stuff has happened... He will be raised on the third day. So I'll be dead, but on the third day I'll be alive again. It's shocking when it's, when it's laid out in such stark, specific terms like this, that after Jesus died on the cross, how many disciples were expecting him to come back on Sunday morning? Or anytime on Sunday? <laughs> Zero. None of them were expecting it. Even though he told them, but they weren't expecting it. And when he ascended, after his resurrection, after he had been alive, sometime during those 40 days before he ascended, it said they worshipped him, but some 
doubted. I think that's in Matthew 28. Maybe it's at the beginning of Acts. I'm not sure. It's, it has, it's around the time of his ascension. At least the texts are, are around that. And it says they worshipped him. And some doubted. Even after that. Even after they say, I'm alive again. Some people continue to still doubt him. We would never do that. Right? Like, how does it mean that you just said... Well, they did when Assyria and Babylon. <laughs> they, did, they didn't see the promises of Christ. Yeah, right. Those, those were the ones they had to wait for. A long time. Yeah. They had, they had other prophecies that they could see come true, but none of them were going to live long enough to see that one come true. And that's, again, why they were saved by faith. None of them saw it, but they, those that believed um, were saved. Okay, um, so Jesus promises he'll, he'll rise again, and he does, and we all know it. Um, and yet there are times where God makes promises to us, and sometimes we can doubt those too. For example, I'm always with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And yet there may be times in our lives when we feel like God has left us and, and he has forsaken us. Um, it may look that way, just like it looked like Jesus was dead. But his promise is, his promise was he'll rise again. His promise to us is, even if you can't see me or even feel me, you can always hear me because I speak to you in my word. And I'm always with you, even when you don't know it. So... Um, we also are tempted at times to doubt Jesus' clear word, even when we know that he keeps his promises. All right, so Jesus told his disciples clearly what his mission was. This is what he came to do. Yet they never seemed to fully understand it until after the resurrection. Even though they didn't understand what was going to happen to Jesus, they did understand what it was like to have trouble in the world. That's why Jesus reminded them that God is always working to bless us, just as he has always blessed the rest of creation. But even so, they needed to remember the blessings that were most, the, the most important ones to seek. And so we have a lengthy reading here from Luke chapter 12. Um, and as, as we're going through this, you know, Jesus makes various promises to them, um, but he also redirects them what they should do in times of trouble and remember how much God loves them and, and has promised to take care of them. So if we start in Luke 12 at verse 22... I don't know if uh, someone wants to read the whole thing or read some of it and then stop and let someone else take over. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than food. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, how they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory, was not a great life in the world. God so holds the crap, which is a lie, and he will say, how much more will he hold you? Will you have a little faith? And do not see what you are to eat, what you are to drink, or to worry, for all of the nations of the world seek after these things. Your Father knows you need them. Instead, Okay, thank you. Um, now, a couple of things here. First of all, it's great comfort, you know, when, when people look at their lives and see how troubled they might be and how many different struggles they have. Jesus directs them to look at the field and see how beautiful the, the grass is with its different lilies and flowers and how beautiful it is. And, and he's saying to them, 
yes, you may have some difficult challenges in your life, but look what God does for dirt. He, he makes it beautiful um, and prosperous. And you're worth way more than lilies or birds to God. Um, so he will bless you as well. Now, it's not the blessings that people always want, um, but it's the blessings that they need. And that, that's what he kind of gets to here towards the end. Now, it's obviously a little bit of hyperbole. It's a little exaggeration. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Obviously, we have to worry about what we're going to eat or drink, or at least we have to be concerned about it. We don't just sit there somewhere and wait for food to come to us. Uh, that's not likely to happen unless we're called Elijah uh, from that story in the Old Testament. Um, but what he's saying is don't be consumed by it. Don't let these pursuits of worldly things be the things that either trouble you or, or are your focus. Uh, obviously, these are part of life. But don't let this be the thing that consumes you. Don't be looking for worldly stuff. Uh, and then that's what he says at the end. God knows you need these. He'll make sure that, that you're able to receive these things. What should you focus on? If you're going to be worried about anything, if you're going to focus and be fixated on anything, it shouldn't be on how big your house is, how nice your car is, how, how full your bank account, uh, how full your belly. You know, all these things that people want, popularity, wealth, uh, 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 power, respect, all those things that the world chases after. What does Jesus say to pursue and chase after? Seek the kingdom of God. And all these other things can be added to you. But if you're going to be focused on or fixated on something, let it be on God. Let that be our focus. If we're going to worry about stuff, worry about things like, did I make time this morning for my devotions? Did I remember to thank God for um, whatever he's done? Um, uh, a neat little story that I might use in the sermon about Tom at his funeral is they said one of the things that really drove Tom crazy is when people didn't say thank you. He, he would get a shot from the doctor and thank the doctor for it because that's just what he believed in was saying thank you. And when other people wouldn't say thank you, it kind of got under his skin. Well, I guess we all have our things that maybe irritate us, but that was one of the things that irritated him. And, and so I, I tie that into this is... Um, did I thank God for the things I do have? It's easy for us to look at all the things we don't have, but what about things we do have? You know, all of us here, I think, have a roof over our heads, clothes on our back, food in our bellies, um, people who care about us. Uh, obviously, we have Christ and His Word and His sacraments and all of the spiritual blessings He gives us. And I made this comment to the confirmands, because we're studying the Ninth and Tenth Commandments, about being content. I said, you know, we're richer than 95% of the world. The whole world. And they looked at me like, are you crazy? We're not rich. Yes, we are, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, many of us have more. Does anybody in here have more than one TV in their house? Most of us, I mean, some of us may not have any TVs, um, more than one TV? That's crazy. How many people in the world do you think have more than one TV or even have a TV? How many have more than one vehicle in their family? Now, if you're kind of alone, you probably only have one, but, you know, we, we have, we had four. Jake took one of them to college. One of them still parked in our driveway for Bella to use, and we have two other ones. You're not going to convince me that I'm not rich. <laughs> we are exceedingly rich. Um, and so the focus is not on what we don't have, but if you're going to be worried about stuff, make sure you worry that you've thanked God appropriately for what you do have, because we all are richly blessed. Is our life perfect? No. Do we have everything we would possibly want? No. But we're pretty rich and we're pretty blessed. So if we focus on the kingdom of God, our focus can sort of... Um, uh, help us to remember all the blessings we do have and be content with them. Uh, so seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you as well. Uh, Jesus, this is moving on to the next paragraph, Jesus wanted the people to know that if they rejected God, there would be a terrible consequence for that. As long as we're in uh, Luke 13, read verse 3 somebody. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will be all likewise perish. Yeah, so here Jesus is warning the people, not that they're going to die, because that's a given. Everybody knows that. When he says you're going to perish, he's talking about eternally. And so he, he knows that this is a, a possible consequence for the people of his day and the people of every day. And so he's trying desperately to warn them to not let that happen to them. 
But he also wanted people to know how much God loved them and would forgive them if they simply stopped trying to earn their way into heaven and trusted God's promises to forgive them instead. So there is law. Jesus definitely preached law, but he also preached gospel that God will forgive you um, if you just trust in his promises and, and believe his promises. Jesus often used parables to teach the people about God's forgiveness and how we should respond to it. For example, the parable of the unmerciful servant. Um, we won't necessarily read all of these, um, but this is an important one to read because of uh, how, how much it applies to all of us. Uh, Matthew 18, starting at verse 23. Uh, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Now, before we move on, the master is not evil. He is just. And this 10,000 talents, uh, I think I read somewhere that that's like 60 lifetimes of money or whatever it is. It was the kind of money that you couldn't accidentally borrow. I mean, this guy was deep, deep in debt. And there was no way that even if he you know, paid every penny he earned for the rest of his life, he could ever pay it back. And that's purposeful. Whatever that amount is in modern day money, and I don't know what it is. The point that Jesus was making with the parable is he could never repay it. So it was just for him and his family to be sold into slavery and everything that he has to be taken to pay off this debt. Uh, by the way, whether it's important to detail or not, the fact that he ran up such a debt means this guy has done some things he probably shouldn't have done. He made some investments, gambled, whatever he did, you know, he made bad choices. And so the consequence is not evil, it's just. And notice that the master is not angry. He just, he's just matter of fact. Okay, this is the consequence for you not being able to pay what you owe. And then the man, the servant, fell on his knees, begged him, have patience, and I'll pay you everything. No, no, you won't. You can't. There's no way you possibly could. But the master had pity on him anyway and forgave the debt. Not that he said, okay, I'll, I'll set up a payment plan for you. He said, you know what? I forgive you. I forgive the debt. You don't owe me anything. So it was an amazing act of generosity on the part of the master. But when that same servant went out, continuing on, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, um, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Okay. Now this part of the parable obviously makes the servant look really bad. Why? Because he had such a huge debt forgiven. He should be on cloud nine. He should be so happy that he's out of debt. He doesn't owe anybody anything. What a joyful um, gift to, to receive. And yet after receiving the gift, what does he do towards someone who owes him money? Demands every penny of it. And this is a more reasonable amount. Uh, it could have been paid back to him over time, but he's not going to allow it. He says, no, I want it now or else I'm going to send you off into prison. I'm going to sell, uh, sell you into slavery. Um, and, and he did. He put him in prison until he should pay back the debt. Um, by the way, that's, that was common. Debtor's prison. That's where the word redeem comes from. Redeem means to buy back. It's to pay a price. To redeem somebody is to set them free from the debt that they owe. So, you know, again, when we talk about Jesus as Redeemer, we talk about the, the, the blood that he paid to set us free from the debt that we owe to sin. All right, verse 31. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then the master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also will my Father in heaven will do to you, every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. 
Now, I, when I, I preached on this text earlier this year, and it, and it struck me, when he first sold this man and his family, or said he was going to sell them into to prison, there was no anger. He didn't say anything about any emotional response. He just said, you owe this money. You can't pay it. Here's the consequence. Now he's mad. And it had nothing to do with money. He didn't care if the guy could pay him back or not. What he cared about was that this person would respond appropriately to the gift he had received. And, and it's mentioned in multiple times here, you wicked servant, and in anger the master turned him over. So there's obviously some unhappiness there from the master towards this unforgiving servant. And then Jesus tells you the, the point of the parable. So will my father do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother from the heart. Some of you are maybe better at this than I am. I struggle with this sin of forgiving people. Um, I, I have a terrible memory, but for some reason I can remember every little slight somebody did. That I can remember. I, can rem I can't remember kids that I coached in football last year, but I can remember the names of kids in third grade who picked on me, which is so weird. But anyhow, that's a, that's a struggle for me, and maybe for some of you as well, to forgive people because they don't deserve it. You want to see them suffer because they deserve that. Um, and, and you're just sort of hoping that justice will be done. But if justice was done, what would that mean for us? We, we'd be in a little tr trouble ourselves, wouldn't we? God has, and I think it, go, it goes back to the, the self-righteousness that so many of us carry around thinking, I know I'm a sinner, but I'm not as bad as that guy. That guy really should get drop kicked by God. I know I'm bad, but he's worse, so God really should punish that person instead. And I think we sort of live our lives that way, and so we justify it when we refuse to forgive this guy. Because we forget how depraved, what wretched sinners we are, that we think, well, of course God's going to forgive me. I'm pretty good. He doesn't have to forgive that much. It's just a little debt that he has to forgive. So we don't appreciate it. And then we want that guy, like I said, God's full wrath poured out on him. And because we want God to do it, we figure, well, if God's not going to do it, I'm going to do it myself. And I'm not going to forgive them because they don't deserve it. And uh, it's really the story of Jonah. Um, yeah, go ahead, Molly. Do you? Good. Uh, good to know. Uh, it, Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. And it's not because he was afraid of them. It's because he knew they were wicked at that time. They were the people oppressing Israel, and, and they were the bad guys. He knew if he went and preached there and they believed it, God would have mercy on them. And he didn't want God to have mercy on them. He wanted God to condemn them. So he goes, I'm not going there. I want those people to suffer. And, of course, God eventually got him there. And he did what God told him to do, grudgingly. Does anybody remember how the story of Jonah ended? I mean, God forgave the people. Where was Jonah at this time when God was forgiving the people and not bringing on them the destruction he had threatened? And it, yeah, he was sitting on a plant on a hill overlooking Nineveh. And what did he want to happen? What was he hoping to see while he sat on the hill overlooking the city? He was hoping God was going to rain down fire. And when it didn't happen, he was angry with God. And he was frustrated with God. And then the story kind of goes off. And basically God says, why should I not show mercy to them? If I can show mercy to you, why can't I show mercy to them? Uh, and that's kind of what Jesus is saying with this parable, is why are you holding grudges? Why are you refusing to forgive people when you have been so freely forgiven? You didn't have to grovel. God forgave you freely for the sake of Jesus. Why are you putting any other demand on anyone else other than, like I said, I think it's our self-righteous nature to think, well, <laughs> of course he'd forgive me. I am pretty good. But that person over there, they need a good spanking from God. Um, and so Jesus warns us, if we aren't going to forgive other people, neither will God forgive us. So really important for us to keep that in mind, that we have been freely uh, forgiven, so freely we are to forgive others. Um, where are we at? We're down at the bottom of the page. Jesus showed how freely God the Master has forgiven us. We therefore should forgive others just as freely. Next page. In the parable of the workers in the vineyard, Jesus taught the people that what he taught 
the people that what mattered most wasn't how long you had believed God's promises, but that you did believe them. There were some people who thought they were better than others because they had worshipped God their whole lives. But even those who only come to learn and trust God's promises at the last moment are just as forgiven as those who have tried to be good all their lives. That was the point that, the point was that God's gift to us is completely dependent on Him, not on our attempts to be good. So we won't read that parable, uh, but you know the story of how they came to work at different times of day and they all got paid the same amount, uh, which was frustrating for the ones who worked all day, but the Master said, I gave you exactly what I promised. You have nothing to be upset about. And so it is for God who gives us salvation freely, which is what He promised to us. Why should we begrudge Him when He gives freely? Freely to someone else. Now in Luke 23, Jesus is trying to remind us that our gift, that his gift to us is dependent on him, not on us. And uh, you can quickly look it up here. Uh, if you, even if you just get to Luke 23, you can probably guess what thing did Jesus do to show that it isn't about how faithful you've been all your life. It's about whether or not you believe. What thing did Jesus do? Forgave the thief on the cross. Yeah, the thief hanging next to him on a separate cross, who as far as we know, didn't lead any kind of holy life. But in his last moments, he put his trust in Jesus. And Jesus said, I will see you shortly in paradise. Now that is not a prescription for how to live your life. Is have all the fun you can, and then right before you're dead... Ask for forgiveness and, and, you know, expect to be ushered in. It could work that way, but of course you'd be playing a, a dangerous game. Uh, in the Middle Ages, they believed that baptism, this was sort of a Catholic church teaching, uh, they believed baptism would forgive all of your sins up to that point. Completely forgiven, but after that, well now you're going to start to be held responsible for your sins. So guess what a lot of people did? They waited to get baptized because, you know, they believe they got to pay for their sins. They got to do penance and they got purgatory. They got all these things. They want to avoid that stuff. So, you know, if you can at least wait to get through your teenage years, then you don't have to pay for those sins, at least now just your adult years. Oh, and some people who usually they were wealthy and could afford better health care, um, they would literally wait till their deathbed and be baptized because that way they had very few sins to pay for in purgatory. All the rest of them were wiped out by baptism. And, and while it's true that your sins are forgiven in baptism, they're also forgiven forward. That's why we can baptize infants, because it's God's grace is not some sort of magic incantation. It's a gift that he gives to us, and we continue to have that gift after baptism as well. Uh, so the point here that Jesus is making is, you don't have to be righteous your whole life. You just have to believe. And even uh, faith as small as a mustard seed, is saving faith. There's no such thing as strong faith and weak faith. There's just faith. Saving faith. Moving on to the paragraph here. Jesus knew that there was a lot of hatred in the world. That was especially true for the Jews who hated the Romans. But Jesus wanted his people to forgive others and pray for them, especially their enemies. So he told them the parable of the Good Samaritan, which you all know. A Samaritan who the Jews hated turned out to be the hero of the story because he showed love for his enemy. And since God loves all people, even the people that we think of as enemies, he wants us to do the same. I made this point to the confirmands last Wednesday. I said, think in your mind of your best friend. Okay, whoever it is. And now imagine that someone else in your class is picking on them, bullying them, calling them names. What would you do? You know, they, they would defend them, they'd stand up for them, they'd fight for their friend. And I said, well, why is that? Well, because we love them, we care about them. I said, do you realize that every person that we hate, God loves? He loves every one of them. So even though we may not like that person, God does. So think about how you feel when people attack the people you care about. Now imagine how God feels when you're attacking the people he cares about. And uh, I, don't, you know, I don't know what kind of point that made for them or if it's something that they'll remember their whole lives or not. But it's certainly something for us to remember that it's easy for us, whether it's a politician, uh, an athlete, a neighbor, whoever it might be, it's awfully easy for us sometimes to uh, attack someone else that we don't like. It would be helpful for us to remember God loves them. Jesus died for them. And maybe that would help us to remember how important it is to see them not as we do, but as God does. 
And that's, that's kind of what we learn from the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan is a famous parable. Perhaps even more famous is the parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal means wandering or rebellious. In that story, excuse me, a boy disrespects his dad by taking his inheritance early and then spending it all on wild and sinful living. After he ran out of money, he went back to his father for help. But rather than scolding his son, the father threw him a big party. That's how God will respond to everyone who repents of their sins and looks to him for forgiveness. Now again, I know we're a little short on time. You know the parable. We don't have to reread it. But just, it's a powerful reminder to us that after everything his son did to him, his father ran to him, wrapped his arms around him, and welcomed him home. In fact, he even threw him a party. He didn't chew him out about all the dumb things he had done. He threw him a party because, as, he, as the father told his other son, my son who was lost is now found. He's back home. This is where I wanted him to be. And it's the same thing for us as sinners. We spend so much time, at least some people do, worrying about what God's going to say or what he's going to think. And, well, I wandered away from him. And he's not going to take me back. Just look at this parable and look how he welcomes people back. Uh, at the ch last church that I served, uh, a woman who is now sainted, wonderful woman. But there's one little thing that, that uh, was a bit of a problem. Uh, we had greeters, and they were signed for each week. And every time it was her turn to greet, and somebody came to church who hadn't been there in a while, well, where have you been? It's about time you should come back here. You know, where do you get off skipping six weeks in a row, and now you come back? Like, oh, don't do that. So we, we did have to have a talk with her. But, you know, she didn't approach the, the prodigal to son the same way that God did in this parable. And so uh, when we see somebody who hasn't been here in months, hopefully we treat them the same way God treats us. And we welcome them back with open arms and we, we let them know this is a place where they're loved and accepted. Even if they've made bad choices and had bad decisions or whatever, it doesn't change the fact God still loves them, forgives them and welcomes them back here into his place. All for one reason. Why does God continue to welcome us back here every, every week? Baptism. We're his children. He's never going to say, no, nope, no, nope, here's what you need to do before you can come back into my house. No, he welcomes us back uh, unconditionally because we're his baptized children. All right, let's finish up. Besides preaching and teaching, Jesus also continued to heal people as he made his way back to Jerusalem. Along the way, he healed a boy who had been possessed by a demon. He healed two blind men, and he healed ten men who had leprosy. Um, again, because we're short on time, I encourage you to take these home, and you can read these stories for yourselves and be reminded of them. Uh, the ten men who had leprosy, does anybody remember what nine of the men did? Went on, their way. went on their way and didn't return to say thank you. Would have really drove Tom up the wall. Um, the one who did came back and, and worshipped Jesus, recognized that he was God. And of course, the one who came back was, what does it say? It was a Canaanite, he was a Gentile, whatever it was. He wasn't one of those people that you would normally be the hero of the story. Uh, he was you know, one of the bad guys, according to Jewish theology. And that was the, the, good, the good one who came back. Of course, the other neat thing about that was uh, he said, go show yourself to the priest because if you have leprosy, you can't go in the temple. You can't go anywhere near the temple. Now that they were clean, they were able to go in and worship God in the temple. And only one actually did worship God. He's the one who came back to Jesus. Okay, last paragraph. Uh, a couple sentences here. Jesus did all these things in preparation for his final and most important week on earth, Holy Week. During that time, Jesus fulfilled all the Father had sent him to do. And that's what we will talk about next week, is Holy Week. Anybody have any comments or questions? If not, then go with God's blessings. And have a safe and joyful week in the Lord. We'll see you again next week.